Welcome to Think Diverse, a fresh and deep look at the issues surrounding diversity and inclusion. I'm your host, Catherine DeVries, and I'm a Dean of Diversity and Inclusion at Bocconi University. In every episode, I pick the brains of one of my Bocconi colleagues about their research about diversity and inclusion. This all to understand how diversity manifests itself in our daily lives, our society, and our economy. In this episode, we're going to delve into gender at the workplace. Repeatedly reading about the gender pay gap and the glass ceiling, not to mention sexual harassment, might make you think that the workplace is not a place for women. But does it need to be this way? And what is more, why is it so difficult for women to pursue a fulfilling career? Recent research points towards a new feature that might explain gender effects at work, temporal flexibility. Men might be able to profit from the demands of the job in terms of working long hours or being able to meet the demand for business travel and so on. Luisa Galliardi, assistant professor at the Bocconi Department of Management and Technology, is investigating the relationship between temporal flexibility and women's penalization in the workplace. In a recent paper, co-authored with Miriam Mariani and Stevio Breschi, both Bocconi professors, Luisa points to the link between temporal flexibility that's required on the job and women's career progression, and better maybe said, the lack of career progression. Luisa, thank you so much for joining us here at Think Diverse. Thanks, Catherine, for inviting me today. So you really stress the importance of temporal flexibility. I think it would be good maybe to define what that concept is and also what made you study it. Yes. Now, when we speak about temporal flexibility in the context of, with, of this research, we refer to the flexibility that is required by firms on the job. And it, that is substantially different from the flexibility that employees may actually demand in order to balance uh, uh, their uh, uh, family and work commitment, for instance. Uh, now, in this context, the main uh, source of inspiration from an academic point of view has been uh, the recent book by Claudia Goldin, who uh, spoke about uh, uh, the role of uh, temporal flexibility and in particular uh, the um, inability or in any case the difficulties that women have to meet the demand for temporal flexibility from firms as one of the grand challenges that we need to confront with uh, if we want to uh, really um, tackle the issue of gender equality in the labor market. I need to say that besides academic research, this is uh, uh, somehow uh, a topic that hits close to home for many of us. For instance, I moved to Bocconi about three years ago, just after, the, uh, just after my first childbirth. And at the same time, my husband moved from uh, a multinational corporation that was headquartered in Italy to a multinational corporation that was headquartered in the US. By observing his new working scheduled, schedule, I realized how much it takes to work across time zones. And I started wondering to what extent women are in the same position of men when confronting an increasing demand for temporal flexibility in the workplace. So somehow I can say that uh, the genesis of this research also com comes from personal real world observation. Like often in research where the things you, you see in life you want to understand better. Yeah. <laughs> One of the key takeaways is that this lack of temporal flexibility is a component of women's penalization in the workplace. So how did you conclude that? How did you come to that finding? To capture uh, the effect of an increase in temporal flexibility uh, in our research, uh, we compare employees at firms that are acquired in the same time zone versus uh, firms that are acquired in a different time zone. Uh, the uh, main uh, underlying hypothesis here is that uh, the requirement for temporal flexibility increase in the latter because employees need to adjust to non-overlapping time schedules. 
Indeed, we find that uh, women that work for firms that are acquired in a different time zone are penalized in their post-acquisition career compared to men and compared to acquisitions that take place in the same time zone. And what is the key kind of factor driving that difference? The key factor that drives our finding is uh, uh, the difficulty of women to adjust to this greater demand for temporal flexibility due to a number of, uh, of reasons that may be related to the organizational culture or also to more uh, wider cultural biases across countries. So could you share a number with us or a statistic that gives us a kind of a better picture of this phenomenon, better sense of this phenomenon? Our results actually uh, suggest a sizable effect. So we find that women are 12.5% less likely than men to make a career step after the completion of the deal. And interestingly, this effect is even larger when we focus on time zone differences that are likely to generate higher constraints in balancing personal and professional commitments. This is the case, for instance, if we take into account acquisitions that involve a two, three hours difference between the target and the acquirer firms. These, just to be clear, are cases in which you have to either wake up very early in the morning or work later at night to pick up calls or to attend meetings. So do you think that this temporal flexibility that you've highlighted is an important factor here is generally a need of, of a modern corporation or is it an expectation based on some norm or some kind of biased understanding of working? In other words, are women being discriminated or are they simply just kind of selecting into a, a poor job that doesn't fit their life schedule? Now, temporal flexibility is, of course, ubiquitous uh, uh, nowadays, uh, and uh, this is especially true for managerial and professional jobs. Uh, we do see that uh, uh, women are somehow suffer a disadvantage in these occupations in terms of both access and career progression. Uh, we also uh, see that very often uh, the demand for temporal flexibility, more than being essential for productivity, is really taken as a signal of devotion and commitment toward the organization. So there is an issue with the organizational culture. And this is also uh, manifested by the fact that we see differences across countries. For instance, in Scandinavian countries where working schedules are more compressed on average and uh, uh, we see uh, an higher balance between working and leisure time, this issue may be less evident than in other places. So this evidence in general suggests that cultural difference explain at least part of the story. Although I think that the real question uh, the real elephant in the room here is whether we really think that uh, the, ability, the ability or willingness to meet the demand for temporal flexibility should be considered a key attribute to be rewarded by firms. And in particular, whether it makes sense for firms to prioritize these attributes over uh, other uh, individual characteristics that may be may affect more significantly both firm performance and firm productivity. So just kind of like linking up to your last response, which was really also stressing in some ways you could formulate a different way that companies might be really demanding overwork here as a commitment signal to the, to the, to the, to the company. It might just not only affects women more, but women might not be the only losers here. So how would you define the cost for companies that really kind of discriminate based on this overwork bias and specifically might discriminate then women based on this, on this kind of demand for overwork? I, I perfectly agree with you, Catherine, that women are not the only one that loses out from this uh, arrangement in the sense that there are hidden costs for firms as well. Uh, 
in, in what we observe is that by screening out potential employees based on their constraints to work over time and with flexible schedules, companies somehow voluntarily restrict their catchment area and somehow undergo the risk of losing talents by prioritizing individual attributes and individual characteristics that are not necessarily essential for productivity. This also may explain why, for instance, we still uh, uh, confront with the so-called skill bias glass ceiling effect, which basically is the permanent synapical position of men, even when they are significantly less qualified than women. So somehow, probably we are looking at the wrong attributes when picking up talent uh, uh, and uh, selecting people, especially for uh, apical positions. So that's really kind of an important finding and maybe also leads to advice for companies about how to recruit and on which characteristics they should be recruiting or might be recruiting and and, and that's not actually generating productivity. So just on a kind of more personal base, has there been a person that you met during your research that has made an impact on you? There has been a person that has been particularly inspiring for this research, although I need to say that I, I, I didn't have the chance to meet her personally. Uh, and he's a person that actually passed away while we were developing this, uh, this, this research, which is Ruth Baden-Ginsburg. That is uh, uh, a, the second woman that served on the Supreme Court of Justice in the US and a real pioneer in the debate about gender equality. Now, uh, Ruth Baden-Ginsburg already in 2009, while commenting on a landmark United Supreme Court decision Mueller versus Oregon that confirmed the constitutionality of a law that prevents women in many occupations from working over time and with flexible schedules based on what has been defined at that time, the differences between sexes, suggested that actually uh, constraints to work with flexible schedules are nowadays one of the key impediments to reach gender equality in the labor market. So uh, although this uh, uh, explanation has been only recently uh, explored in academic research, there is a flavor of uh, its importance uh, already uh, since quite a few years. So how do you think, given your research, that companies should behave in order to kind of combat this, uh, this uh, gender discrimination, but also basically the waste in talent or maybe, you know, a human resource policy that doesn't meet their demands for productivity? Yeah, that's a great question. Now, I, I believe the last mile to gender equality in labor market opportunity passes by these incentives for firms to reward uh, disproportionately over time work and temporal flexibility and to value more independence and autonomy as a way to foster individual productivity. Now, at the first glance, this may come as a bad news for firms, but it may ultimately push them to value objective individual characteristics such as skills, competences, attitudes that are much more likely to affect firm performance than the willingness to work according to unusual and uncomfortable, especially for women working schedules. So I think uh, ultimately uh, focusing, refocusing uh, uh, the str strategies for the management of human capital uh, towards uh, these more essential uh, characteristics may, may open up opportunities for firms to really attract and retain the best talented individuals independently on their gender. So now you've kind of given some specific focus on what firms can do, I think, which is really useful. But I guess also in some ways the elephant is in the room is, you know, public policy or governments. Would there be anything that could be done in terms of public policies that could mitigate this issue? 
Now, well, government and formal institutions more in general can do a lot and can operate at different levels. Uh, uh, they can promote, of course, uh, uh, employers, employers' policies for inclusion and employee well-being. Uh, this, uh, for instance, goes in the direction of what companies are doing recently, uh, trying to somehow regulate the degree of flexibility that uh, uh, the employers can ask for on the job as a result of uh, the general trend that we have seen under the pandemic uh, with the spread of remote working. Uh, another possibility is, of course, to uh, leverage public policies that reduce the family workload. Uh, again, this is something that uh, uh, it's close to home and one uh, possible uh, and very straightforward measure would be to increase access to uh, nursery and, uh, and uh, daycare and preschools. Of course, the elephant in the room remains the possibility to tackle culturally rooted causes that prevent women from supplying flexibility in the labor market. And this implies somehow uh, be becoming aware that there are still important stereotypes uh, that ultimately undermine uh, the capacity uh, and the possibility for women to equally compete in the market. Such cultural beliefs are, of course, hard and slow to change, so we will see whether our society will be able to uh, confront this challenge. Clear. Well, you know, it'd be interesting to see how that how that indeed develops uh, as uh, uh, increasingly public policies directed towards diversity are, are being rolled out. So maybe we're looking at a generational change. We'll see. So in closing, Bocconi University's motto is knowledge that matters. So how do you think your research impacts uh, someone else's life or like public life in general? Now, I was asked many times about this question, and in particular, whether this research produces real-world implication. Uh, indeed, I think this is the case. What we do is to use uh, time zone data and acquisition data to uncover a much more general phenomenon that has to do with the uh, implications of women constraints uh, in the workplace. And our key... Uh, resolution from this research is that when these constraints make it difficult for an employee to meet the demand for flexibility from firms, they translate into a disadvantage. So I believe getting aware of this means uh, uh, the possibility to create a fairer workplace and a more inclusive culture at the organizational level, as well as a win-win situation in which uh, women are not penalized on the job, based on, criterion, on criteria that are not necessarily associated with productivity, and firms are put in the condition to select the best and more talented employees to boost their performance. Thank you, Luisa, for your time, and thank you all for listening. This was Think Diverse, a podcast on diversity and inclusion from Bocconi University. To be notified about new episodes, subscribe to Think Diverse on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or Spreaker.